This is Let's Get Growing with horticulturalist Nathan Wilson at Lanier Nursery and Gardens in Flowery Branch. Get information you need for gardening, landscaping, and home plant care. We're taking your calls right now at 706-865-3181 or email info at wrwh.com. Now, here's Nathan. Good morning, gang. I hope we're having a great uh, day this morning. I know it's nice and chilly outside. It feels really good. Things are really changing already, but the question is, for how long? How long will this stuff last, this great weather we're having? Well, it was very warm last week, but this week it's very cool. We'll see. Welcome to Georgia. Somebody says if you want to uh, know what the weather is like, just just stick around and see because it's always changing. I hope that um, this morning I can help you with some of your gardening questions, whether uh, you have some bug issues, whether you have some weed issues, or whether you just want to talk a little bit about some good things. We'd love to hear some success stories because that is my goal this morning, is to help you be successful in your landscape, help you be successful in your garden, help you be successful in your uh, lawns as well. So this morning, give me a call at 706 eight six five three one eight one or if you'd rather send us a message, send us a message at info that's I N F O at W R W H dot com and you can just type out a little message for us of course and you can uh, get your questions answered here for the next hour. Now, if you'd like to join us on uh, Facebook, you can go to WRWH's Facebook page or my Facebook page at Lanier Nursery and Gardens, uh, and there will be links there to YouTube where we're streaming live. So if you uh, would rather see me, <laughs> you can do that, which uh, I really do have a face for radio, I guess, the old joke said goes, or maybe a face for gardening. I don't know. It's a little dirty. But anyhow, this morning, give us a call at 706-865-3181, regardless of how you're listening. Uh, you can give us a call, and we'll be glad to answer all of your gardening questions. <clears throat> now, uh, this morning, I, I do want to talk a little bit about what the goal of gardening is. What is the point of gardening? Well, the whole concept um, that has been described throughout this, the years is that we're trying to create a sense of place. Now, that sounds really uh, philosophical, I guess. But the, the idea with gardening is we're trying to create a sense of place. Maybe this is a place uh, perhaps from your childhood that you're familiar with. Or maybe it's a place that you've traveled to, some far off exotic land. Or maybe it's just a place to rest or relax. But the goal here is to create a sense of place. Uh, here in the past few years, people have described them as creating outdoor rooms, that gardens are outdoor rooms and they're an extension of the house. And as you leave uh, the building, the structure uh, that you live in, you're, you're not really leaving it. You're still there. It's just another place in your house. But um, in my mind, the real beauty of, the garden, of gardening and creating a sense of place is to create a place that's never been before. We're trying to create a place that's never been before. How great that is. A place that no one's ever seen yet. A place that is yet to come. And you can do that uh, with gardening. That's for sure. So this morning, if you have a question you'd like to get answered, uh, feel free to give us a call at 706-865-3181 or send me a message, info at wrwh.com. <clears throat> this morning, you could also call me and talk a little bit about garden stories. Okay, uh, what I mean by that is maybe there's a plant that really reminds you of a person. Plants, uh, because we're out there digging and growing and sometimes we grow with other people like grandmothers or mothers, you know, there's this connection between the plant and the person. And in reality, uh, you know, you, you may see a plant, I know I do, I see a plant and it reminds me of someone. This week I was reminded of that at the nursery. A customer came in and started talking about a plant that reminded him of his uh, grand grandmother. And I said, well, I have the same story here, the same situation. I have the plant uh, that's at my grandmother's house that I think of. Every time I see a, an Akuba plant, such an unusual name, but Akuba is a great evergreen large shrub. Uh, generally they're flaked with dust, we call it. Uh, they're a green leaf, but they're flaked with yellow spots. And the Akuba's... Um, it, this particular Cuba is planted to the side of her house, and uh, I understand the story to go that my father planted it there uh, years ago when he was a kid, and it's still growing there. And as a kid, I would grow. I was growing up 
playing around my grandmother's house, running around that bush. And I remember every few years she would cut it, have it, have it cut pretty low to the ground, and it would just rebound with a vengeance. And every time I see that, it's it's really just a special plant that reminds you, you know, of a family member, a loved one. Maybe you have a plant like that, uh, and maybe you'd like to call me and tell me what what it is. Um, but this morning, you can do that by calling seven zero six eight six five three one eight one. Or give me a message, info at wrwh.com. Now it's time for us to travel over uh, to Freedom Park in Cleveland, Georgia, where we have Gordon Benson standing on the line at the Farmer's Market to give us a Farmer's Market update. Hello, Gordon. How are you this morning? I'm doing great. It's a beautiful fall morning, and we have uh, just started our live entertainment over here at the market. Some students from Habersham Central and the 4-H program there are here performing, and it's beautiful. You might be able to hear them in the background. Yeah. But uh, isn't it a great morning? It absolutely is nice and cool. It's definitely a good day to be shopping for a fresh-grown and locally-grown produce. Well, I was telling Jimmy earlier, if anybody was listening back then, mm-hmm. that we have a first here at the market this morning. We actually have table grapes. Um, Kaya Vineyards had some, I guess, grapes that were suitable for table grapes in the winemaking process that they used, and they're here, and they're they're selling quickly, but they're beautiful, and they're very tasty. And we have, of course, the usual green beans and butter beans. We have yellow squash, okra, tomatoes, corn. Oh, we wow. have watermelons, and not the small watermelons, the great big old-fashioned ones. Now, I guess they're old-fashioned, the ones that, that I grew up with. Now they've gotten the smaller versions, which fit in the refrigerator better. But if you want a really big one, they're very good and very tasty. I've already got one in my car. Wow. And we have apples. And we have, of course, flowers and quilts and some handcrafted items like uh, wood turn bowls and some other art items. So it's a great day over here at Freedom Park. Yes, it's going to be a great day so far, and it sounds going to be a special day with all those unique um, offerings that you have there. So definitely uh, maybe just give the folks a quick description of how to get there. I know it's close to the square, but maybe tell them how to get there and they can find you. Well, if you drive to the square in, uh, in Cleveland, where the historic co- courthouse is, um, you will see our signs. We have signs that will direct you. They say farmer's market, locally grown produce, so that will direct you in. But we're basically behind the courthouse, uh, one block over from the main uh, 129 that goes north and south through town, and we're by the First Methodist Church. So. Uh, not hard to find at all, uh, across from Deb's Dollar, if anybody knows that store. Uh, so it's just right here in town. Uh, and plenty of parking and plenty of nice things to buy and see. All right. Well, sounds like a great day to be at the farmer's market. And folks, uh, meet Gordon down there, and he will be glad to show you around and show you some of the great uh, products they have for sale there. Thanks for joining us, Gordon. Um, let's make it a great day at the at the market. Thank you. Appreciate you. Appreciate the opportunity to promote. Absolutely. Anytime. Well, we do like to hear that, of course. I always like to mention a little bit about buying local, of course. Being a, a local uh, business myself, we love for people to come and, and give us support. We know the box stores out there, you know, they don't really give as much personality as the local folks do. And so if you want help, if you want assistance, um, if you have questions, generally the people who are there actively growing these things, they're going to be able to tell you um, all the tips and, and tools you'll need to be successful and that's my goal this morning to make you be successful in your lawn garden landscape so give me a call at 706-865-3181 or message me at info at wrwh.com you've got mail and this morning we go straight into some questions which is wonderful because we have a message on the line from kim from flowery branch she says i've had a very busy spring and summer and have not been able to work in my garden as I usually do. Is it too late to fertilize my roses, hydrangeas, and azaleas? Can I use the slow-release type of fertilizers? When do you stop fertilizing? Okay, Kim, thanks for all those many questions. We love to answer them. So let's start off with the first one. Is it too late to fertilize these plants? No, it's not, but it's getting close, okay? If you want to do any fertilizing on roses, hydrangeas, azaleas, evergreens, any kind of shrub um, or perennials, you can go ahead 
and fertilize them now. And then, of course, uh, later on, uh, when it gets to about September 1st, you don't want to do any more. Okay, so we're getting very close. Around Labor Day, that's a good day to shoot for. Around Labor Day, you don't want to do any more uh, fertilizing or pruning or anything like that because that'll encourage plants to grow and they really need a good six weeks before the first frost to harden off and get ready for winter. The next question is, can I still use a slow release type fertilizer? Of course you can um, because they're slowly going to release over the next few weeks. At which will encourage the growth, but also it'll time it at just right uh, for the plant to be able uh, to pull in the nutrition and then to actually grow right before we go into winter. And of course, the last question, when do you stop fertilizing? We already answered, is around uh, Labor Day. So the 1st of uh, September, which is just in a week or so, uh, we want to back off on all those kind of activities. So, Kim, thanks for that question. We really appreciate it, and um, I'd want to remind everybody who's listening, maybe you're out there listening in the uh, car as you're driving around, going to the farmer's market, um, but you can also join us um, on our Facebook channels at WRWH, and of course our Facebook channel at the nursery, Lanier Nursery and Gardens. We're streaming live from YouTube, so you can check us out there. If you want to join there, you can type in a question on our Facebook uh, channels, and we'll be able to answer them for you here live, or give us a call, 706 706- Eight six five three one eight one, or of course mail us info at wrwh dot com. You've got mail now. We do go to Cleveland here. We've got a uh, a great listener, Mary Jo. She says my annual flowers look great this year, but now they look a little peaked. Mm, I love that word peaked. Do I need to rip them out? Well, Mary Jo, a lot of times people do want to just rip out their annual plants this time of year because summer has beat them down, taken them around town, we say, and maybe <laughs> met them in a dark alleyway. But regardless, what is going on is the plant's probably still growing unless they do look too far gone. If they look too far gone, uh, there's really no need uh, to proceed with their life in your garden. You can exchange them for something that looks a little better. But if they aren't too bad looking, here would be my recommendation. Go ahead and cut the half of the foliage back. So take half of the foliage of the plant back, and then you want to apply a well-balanced, slow-release fertilizer, just like we talked to with Kim earlier. And in a couple of weeks, they're going to be blooming their hearts out. Well, if they had hearts, I guess. But they're going to be blooming for you once again. And, of course, they'll last until about um, sometime in October, maybe middle to late October. So I hope that helps, Mary Jo. Like I said, if they look really bad, go ahead and rip them out. But if there's a little bit of life left, cut half of the foliage back and fertilize with a slow-release fertilizer. And in a couple of weeks, they'll be looking really awesome. So thanks for that question, Mary Jo, in Cleveland. And if you want us to help you with your gardening problems or issues, give us a call at 706-865-3181. We're going to take a little bit of a break, but we will be right back with all of your blooming questions. Be sure to check out live editions of Let's Get Growing Saturdays at 9 a.m. on WRWH. Back to more Let's Get Growing with Nathan Wilson. All right. Welcome back, gang, boys and girls. We appreciate you hanging on tight, and hopefully you've um, found some problems in your landscape. Uh, We were just kind of chatting with the folks who are joining us on Facebook and YouTube, and just know that if you join us there... Uh, You not only get a live stream, but you can ask us questions in between uh, breaks, and we'll be glad to uh, entertain you there as well. So uh, if you're not driving, of course, if you're at home alone, not at home alone, I'd be alone, you can be with anybody. But if you're at home and you're not actively moving a vehicle, then we'd like uh, for you to join us on Facebook or or YouTube at WRWH. Just just search that on YouTube, and you can find us, of course, at Facebook as well. I do want to let you know that this morning we do have another episode of Garden Soliloquy with Ethel. She, of course, brings her wisdom and attitude about gardening. Um, That'll be a little later in the show, so be sure to hang around. Um, And also, my plant of the week, uh, I'm going to be sharing with you a little later. And of course, every week, the point of plant of the week is to bring you something new or different uh, that you may not have known about, may not have thought about, um, but something that, of course, provides something for nature, whether it's pollinators or whether it's a shelter for birds, habitat, and whatnot, and generally we're talking about native plants in the uh, plant of the week, so you know that these plants are suited for our region. 
big time. So hang around for Ethel, hang around for Plant of the Week, and let's get you uh, your garden all situated and help you be successful this morning. Give me a call at 706 865 3181 or send us a message info at wrwh.com and we'll be glad to answer that question that's just burning up your roses all right so we go to the to the line here with freddie freddie from sequi says uh is it is it time to apply winter weed pre-emergent yet well freddie i'm glad you asked that question because it's just a tad too early. It's just a little too early to apply this uh, pre-emergent, but I don't want you to forget about it. I don't want you to forget about applying the pre-emergent because what pre-emergent does is it prevents weeds from growing from seed, okay? So, you know, we have henbit or chickweed. These types of uh, weeds can be a problem in the wintertime, but you can go ahead preventatively and you can easily uh, keep that number of weeds that pop up and try to take over. You can easily keep that down uh, by applying this pre-emergent. So, the question that you're really asking is, when do I do it? And, Freddie, the ideal time to do that would be about the middle of September. The middle of September, after you've enjoyed Labor Day and given yourself about a week or two off, go ahead and apply the pre-emergent. Now, there's several types of pre-emergent out there, but we do have a, a pre-emergent from uh, Bonide at the nursery, uh, Lanier Nursery and Gardens. Bonide's product is called Crab, Grass, and Weed Preventer. So even though it, it'll take care of crabgrass, it takes care of pretty much all your uh, general lawn uh, weeds. Now, um, like I said, you do want to apply this in the middle of September, but it's going to be very easy. All you're going to want to do is... Um, all you're going to want to do is use a broadcast spreader because you're going to throw this uh, out across your lawn or even into your uh, and uh, per, sorry your ornamental beds. So trees, shrubs, um, perennial beds, you can throw them out as long as you don't mind the, the taking over any kind of weed or seed that's going to be growing. You can do that um, in any of those areas. So come check me out at Lanier Nursery and Gardens. We'll be glad to get you set up, Freddie. And uh, we go to the phone this morning uh brianna is here with us and brianna how are you hi i'm good good i hear understand you have a question about fruits and veggies for fall yeah i do okay well can what, what can we help you with well i was just wondering what kind of fruits or vegetables i could grow during the fall time oh wonderful so you're interested in uh, getting into gardening a little bit Oh, that's awesome. Well, listen, here's what we want to do. You can definitely plant fruits and vegetables for the fall. There's a few that will uh, survive the winter and do very well. Now, you could probably go ahead and sow some carrots if you wanted like a, a kind of um, a quick turnaround of carrots or radishes. Radishes will grow in a matter of days, as a matter of fact, um, and be ready really soon. But um, if you have some other, uh, some, so if you want to wait a little bit until it just gets a little bit cooler, uh, probably middle of September or so, you could go ahead and plant things like um, kale uh, or cabbage. Um, greens, your, whether it's turnip greens or um, collard greens. I'm drawing some blanks here, but there's plenty of things you can do. Mm. Now, if you want to, you can start them from seed indoors right now, and they'll be ready oh. to transplant uh, later on. But if you'd rather come to the to the nursery, I'll be glad to get, uh, give you some plants, of course, uh, that are ready to go in the ground at the right time to plant them. And like I said, that'll be just a little later in September. But um, does that help answer your questions? Yeah, it does a lot. Okay. Well, hey, thanks for calling in this morning. It's good to hear a young voice getting out there and gardening. Now, you have a, a parent who can help you with some of this? Um, yes. Yeah? Okay, good. Are they experienced in gardening? Kind of. Kind of. Well, hey, look, I've got all the que answers to the questions you need, so you go and you inform your mama and your daddy and uh, get them out there and get their hands dirty. How about that? Okay, I will. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, Brown. We appreciate it, and I hope you continue to listen in. Oh, it's wonderful to hear a young voice out there. I'm assuming that was a young voice. You know, we don't ask how old the people are when they call in, so don't feel don't feel like you know we're going to know much about you. But it sounds like a very young person there who is ready to garden, which is great. So, getting kids into the garden is a wonderful idea.
and I've talked with many grandparents and parents um, throughout the throughout uh, who come visit me at the nursery. I mean, and they talk about gardening for children. And while we are on this subject, I don't know how we got here, but here we are. We um, <laughs> gardening for children is important because you know we really are losing a lot of the information that uh, people people who grew up as young people, uh, like my grandparents' generation, they knew about growing and planting, and we're losing some of that to iPhones and tablets and gaming systems and whatnot. So we do need a resurgence. We need a revitalization of gardening and horticulture. Uh, We definitely need that, and it's going to take a joint effort. It's going to take us all getting out there, bringing kids in. I know that there are plenty of groups um, the Junior Master Gardener Program, which is overseen by the Master Gardeners, who's a part of Cooperative Extension, they go around to different schools and create school gardens, and they maintain and help keep the garden going, getting funding and all of that. So um, if you're interested in how you, if you don't have any children and would like to help children uh, grow things, maybe ask your Cooperative Extension agent, your county agent, as we may commonly call them, uh, to give you, um, to, to just ask how you can be a part of the junior master gardener program through the master gardeners and i think that uh, you'll find that it's really rewarding uh, to be there to to provide this assistance and guidance to children so let's do that this morning or give me a call at 706-865-3181 we'll be glad to take your questions your phone calls you can also watch us a streaming live on youtube just go to youtube and search wrwh Or go to their Facebook page at WRWH um, on Facebook or mine at Lanier Nursery and Gardens, and you can interact with us there. You can give us your questions on the air, uh, I mean, through the the site, the Facebook or YouTube site, and we'll be glad to answer your uh, your questions live on the air as well. And if you are joining us that way, well, in between breaks, we are going to be little, kind of like little garden side chats. Garden side chats. I don't know. That doesn't. I don't know if that works or not. But we'll we'll be able to talk a little bit more um, during the breaks about gardening and answer your questions. Again, that number to call is seven zero six eight six five three one eight one. You've got mail. And this morning we keep getting mails from our box at info at wrwh.com. Joanne from Cleveland. Oh, that's good. Joanne from Cleveland says, My husband mounded about 14 inches of mulch around our newly planted maple tree. Is that enough mulch? Okay. I'm trying to understand here, Joanne. I think what you're saying is that your husband has mounded 14 inches high. Uh, of this mulching material around the newly planted tree. Is that enough? Joanne, the answer is that is way too much. I tell you what's going to be easier than answering this question is going to find a new husband because that is going to cause root rot and, well, stem rot, really, around the base of that plant. This is what we would call a mulch volcano. If you can picture this, folks, you have your tree growing in the ground and this volcano of mulch 14 inches high around the base of that tree. Now, 14 inches needs to be brought down to 2 inches, okay? We only need 2 inches of mulch around the base of our plants, and it does not need to be touching the base of the plant or the uh, perimeter the, the perimeter of the uh, trunk. It needs to be 2 inches away. This is what I call the 2 by 2 rule. Again, that's 2 inches thick of mulch, but 2 inches away from the base of the plant. Now, Joanne, I hope that, uh, I hope that, that uh, makes sense and that that's understandable. Because when we add uh, so much uh, mulch to the plant, we can cause detrimental issues, especially around the bark and all. If we do that, we will see rot and moisture will hang out around the base of the tree. We do not want that. So to summarize, once again, we only want two inches thick of mulch and we want it two inches away from the base of the plant. Folks, this morning, I want you to give me a call if you have a gardening question or a problem that's uh, giving you issues in your landscape, or maybe you have a success story. Tell me something that uh, you love about gardening. Give me a call at 706-865-3181. Or email us at info at wrwh.com. Join us on Facebook and YouTube, and we'll be right back after this quick break. Be sure to check out live editions of Let's Get Growing Saturdays at 9 a.m. on WRWH. 
More great information coming your way on Let's Get Growing with Nathan Wilson. Welcome back, gang. We are having a great time here. We're hanging out, of course, WRWH 93.9 and FM and 1350 AM. But we're also uh, streaming live on Facebook at WRWH. Just search for WRWH 93.9, 1350 on Facebook. Make sure, here's what you want to do. Make sure to like that Facebook page. And then you'll find a link over to uh, WRWH's uh, YouTube channel where you'll find our video aspect this morning. But of course, you can definitely listen uh, live all the time at 93.9 and also oh check out the TuneIn app. The TuneIn app is available on wherever you buy your apps, whether it's the App Store on Apple or uh, whether it's Google Play on Android. Whichever system you're using, go ahead and type TuneIn. That's T-U-N-E-I-N. And there you can search, you can search for the um, WRWH page there, and of course, you can listen all the time to every great program that you find here on WRWH, and you will be able to listen all week long, not just Saturday, but we do want you to listen this Saturday and next Saturday, all Saturdays, because we are here at Let's Get Growing to answer your gardening questions. So you feel free to give us a call at 706-865-3181. We were just chatting a little bit with the folks who are joining us on Facebook and YouTube uh, in between the break, and we were talking a little bit about killing plants. I get a lot of folks at the nursery who come in and they're devastated, they're, uh, they're downtrodden and they're burdened because they have killed a plant or two or three or a hundred. And I try to console them as much as I can because killing a plant is tough, I know. And we've invested in it, of course. We've purchased it or we've grown it from a cutting or a seed. But the reality is that um, killing, a, killing things that are living is going to happen. Things that living will die. And we don't want to get too discouraged, okay? We just want to make better decisions next time. We just want to be, what's the word? We want to be fortified with information. Uh, Information that is reliable and researched. And that way, when we start to do a new thing or go back into planting an old thing that we killed and try it one more time, we feel more confident. And that's what I want to do for you. I want to make you feel confident about doing uh, this kind of gardening that we're talking about, whether it's vegetable gardening, whether it's lawn and turf grass, or whether it's perennials, shrubs, trees, flowering plants, all of these things we want to help you with. So feel free this morning to give us a call at 706-865-3181, or you can send us a message at info at wrwh.com. And, of course, join us live on Facebook and YouTube. Just go to either site and type in WRWH, and you'll find us there streaming live. Um, this morning, we do plan of the week. This morning, um, we, uh, I want to bring up a new topic of discussion for you. Um, this morning, I was going to save it for a little later, but I'm thinking it's a great moment to do this because uh, we were just talking about killing old things, but maybe you want to try something new. And this morning, I've kind of previously recorded a little segment uh, we call Plant of the Week. And we want to bring these new plants to you to give you a taste of something that is different, something you may not know about. And we're going to go ahead and jump into that. So we hope that you enjoy this new Plant of the Week. Today's Plant of the Week is brought to you by the Ericaceous family, the plant family that includes azaleas and blueberries. Today, however, we are going to talk about a strange and unusually named plant known as Zenobia, or honeycups. I know it sounds like some kind of disease that crawled out of the jungles of South Africa, but it's actually a beautiful and underused native plant to the southeast. Zenobia, or honeycups, is a semi-evergreen shrub that will only reach about waist high. Well, maybe the height of a person if left unpruned. Regardless, this plant produces white bell-shaped flowers, much like its cousin, the blueberry. All summer long, Zenobia will provide you with ashy blue-green foliage that makes a great backdrop for your flowering perennials or annuals. But then in the autumn, oh boy, here's the ticket. The fall color is not only outstanding, but it's quite unique. I haven't seen any plant that produces the red, purple, and bronze foliage like Zenobia does. It's simply glorious. Let's get a little more acquainted with this plant, shall we? Even though Zenobia is a native to the southeastern U.S., it derives its name from Queen Zenobia, monarch of the Palmyria Nation, which is located 
located in present-day Syria. History records that Queen Zenobia's face was dark and of a swarthy hue. Her eyes were black and powerful beyond the usual want. Her spirit divinely great and her beauty incredible. So white were her teeth that many thought she had pearls in place of teeth. I couldn't think of a more poetic description of Zenobia the plant either. It definitely has fall leaves of a dark and swarthy hue, true pearly white flowers in the spring, and beauty that is incredible. If you're tired of the same old, same old shrubbery, try something new. Zenobia, also known as Honeycups. It's beautiful, native, and always available at Lanier Nursery and Gardens. Zenobia, a true queen for the native landscape. And it's my plant of the week. All right, folks. Well, I hope you enjoyed Plant of the Week. I know Zenobia is one of my favorite plants. Terrible name, I know, but actually, the more you learn about it, the uh, kinder it gets to you. This morning, you can give us a call at 706-865-3181, or you can email us, info at wrwh.com. We do have a a question coming in from our Facebook and YouTube stream here. Um, uh, Peggy says, what kind of soil should I use in containers? Okay, so what kind of soil should you use in containers? Yes, Peggy, we're getting to that time where we can plant ornamental cabbages and we can plant pansies and even some uh, overwintering poppies, actually. Uh, and some of these plants you can put in containers. We could put all those in containers. But container production is completely different than ground production. You don't want to go out and just dig up soil out of the ground, mainly because this going to be very heavy. It's full of mineral. It's full of uh, uh, heavy-weighted items. We want to use something that is a little uh, more light in weight, okay? And generally, that is kind of a manufactured product that uh, you can find at the nurseries. And this would be made of peat or perlite, some compost even. Um, There's a mixture of of products there, maybe some pine bark. In, In the nursery, we use a lot of pine bark in containers and compost. And so uh, what I want you to do is come check us out at Lanier Nursery and Gardens, and we have a Fafford product. That's the name of the company. And they grow, actually uh, produce um, our professional-grade products, and that's what we sell. So you're getting a tried-and-true tested. Fafford outdoes miracle Grow every year in tests and trials. I don't even know why the box stores keep selling miracle Grow because Fafford is where you want to be. So that's the kind of soil you should use in containers, and it is lightweight, like I mentioned. So if you ever have to move that container, you're not struggling and breaking your back. We definitely don't want that. We want success. So this morning, give us a call at 706-865-3181 or or you can send us a message, info at wrwh.com. Now, this next question, yes. the caller just wanted to give me the question okay. and then listen oh, off the okay. air. Okay. He has some old garden pesticides. Mm-hmm. What is the safe way to dispose of them? Oh. And this is for Ed. He's trying to get rid of them? Yes, and he wants to know a safe environmental environmentally friendly way to dispose of them right okay so let's talk a little bit about this because um ed thanks for calling in we appreciate that um now let's talk a little bit about shelf life okay shelf life is the amount of time that a pesticide or chemical can be used without decreasing in uh, its effectiveness, okay? So, Ed, um, I don't know how long you may have had these um, containers, but even after, like, eight years of sitting on a shelf, most chemicals only decrease a few percentage points as far as effectiveness goes. So say, you know, when you first buy it, it's 100% effective, and after eight years, it may be 92, 84% effective, which still means it's going to work, okay? So if you are concerned that they're old and they're not going to work, I would say you could still hang on to them and uh, use them. Now, depending, because we don't have the details as far as what kind of pesticide, if it's herbicide, if it's insecticide, we we would never recommend to just go pour it out on the ground. We would never recommend that. Um, you can, that's, that's just a big no-no. But you will find on the specific label all the instructions you need. Um, that's a great thing and the beauty about labels is that they tell you pretty much everything you need to know about the pesticide. If it's um, uh, how it needs to be used, how it needs to be stored, what temperature and uh, kind of location you can store it at. And also warnings and dangers and then disposal uh, should be there if you're ready to get rid of that. 
I wouldn't even recommend without knowing the pesticide, just throwing it in a trash can. I wouldn't recommend that. Um, of course, it will go to the landfill uh, ultimately. But um, depending on the type, and if it's an old one, maybe it's one that's already been taken off the market, which would mean we would need some special precautions. Um, but like I said, Ed, you can probably still use these and still be a, still find some effectiveness in the um, in the product. But if you do want to get them off the shelf, they're taking up space and you're never going to use them again, I would check the label because all we have here says pesticides um, but depending on what type of pesticide um, that that would definitely be uh, be of concern if it's a herbicide of course those attack uh, weeds and anything that's green um, they can be selective meaning they'll kill grasses or maybe they'll kill you know broadleaf plants and we don't want to just pour them into the ground that's for sure because uh, with that kind of concentration that can get find their way into the water stream and we're not sure on what kind it is and how long it'll last meaning a residual how long it will reside in the soil after it's been um, dumped. We don't want a chemical dump behind your house or in your garden, Ed, that's for sure. But listen, we do appreciate your question. I would just be sure to check those lines, check those um, uh, check those labels, rather, and see uh, what you can find there. So thanks for calling, Ed. And if you have a question, that's actually a really good question and one that we don't hear a lot of. So, But it's very important to be safe and environment, environmentally friendly and ecologically uh, steward, uh, become an eco. Uh, steward of the of ecology give us a call at 706-865-3181 or send me a message info at wrwh.com and we'll be able to um to answer your questions there like we have for ed and a few others who have emailed us this morning and we continue to go to the line um let's see franklin says do i need to replace container soil every year oh thanks for sending that message franklin because huh, maybe you heard what we were uh talking about earlier as far as with peggy using uh soil in containers now, the key with replacing container soil every year is you don't have to, okay? You don't have to unless you can see that the soil has broken down, um, okay, uh, whether the soil is broken down and it's uh, falling, uh, decomposing. You would have to at least refresh it. Now, the only time that I would say you would want to um, pull out um, pull out old soil and replace it with some new container mix would be if you can see an uh, obvious disease issue. If your plants were diseased, stricken, stricken with problems, um, they could be soil borne, and then planting in in that soil could cause um, a bit of an issue. So uh, we do want to be careful on on that uh, tidbit there. However. Um, if you feel comfort, if you don't feel comfortable always using the same soil, you can. What I've done in the past is take out half of the soil, okay? Take out half the soil and replace with fresh soil, and uh, just about maybe two, two, two what, what, however deep your pot is, eight inches. Take out four inches and put in four inches, because really plants um, only need about eight to ten inches of soil. So if it's a very large container, you know, waist high or something, you don't really have to replace all of the soil every year. Um, but you can. Um, a, a, another case that just popped in my head um, is if you have a lot of plants in there that have created a huge root system, and when you pull the plants out, that it takes out most of the soil with the roots, then of course you're left with a half empty container. Well, just freshen on top and do and uh, kind of start over. But like I said, you don't have to take out all of the soil every year. But if there's a disease issue, I would highly recommend it. Dispose of it, throw it into the garden where you're not growing much of important uh, things, and let it decompose, and it'll just go right back into the garden. We want to remind you folks that you can give us a call this morning at 706-865-3181 or send us a message info at wrwh.com. Uh, we're going to go to our YouTube channel. Look at some questions after the break, and also Ethel will be joining us after the break with her garden soliloquy. So we'll see you shortly with your gardening questions. Be sure to check out live editions of Let's Get Growing Saturdays at 9 a.m. on WRWH. Back to more Let's Get Growing with Nathan Wilson. 
Welcome back, gang. What a great time we've had hanging out on YouTube and uh, Facebook. And you can join us there at WRWH uh, YouTube channel and Facebook channel. Just just search uh, for WRWH Radio and you'll find it there. And be sure to subscribe. Uh, be sure to subscribe because every week that we're live, um, we'll be able to get a notification that, hey, here we are. But, of course, you can listen to us on the TuneIn app if you're streaming um, or go out of town or away and, and can't uh, reach us at 93.9 or 1350 AM. You can can definitely get us on TuneIn app, which you'll just download onto your phone. Now we've got uh, just a few minutes for the show this uh, this this uh, time, but we've got plenty of questions coming in on YouTube, and there's one in particular that we were talking about that I do want to mention. Uh, Nancy's streaming in with us, and she says, "I really love daisies. I have not been able to get them to grow outside." Can daisies grow in the house like a house plant? Now, it would be ideal. It would be great. It would be amazing if that was the case, that we could bring those beautiful uh, ray of sunshine plants into our house. However, I'm afraid they just won't survive very well because daisies do require at least eight hours of sun. Well, let's say at least six, but eight hours would be ideal uh, in order to produce and grow. The plant may... Th- may survive in the house but daisies aren't going to thrive in the house even if you had a sunny window i don't think it would be enough uh, sunlight for you to be successful with that so instead maybe try to till up a nice little area uh, create a bed a perennial bed or border we call it where you can directly plant those into that uh, nice loamy soil now that you've amended it with some organic matter and um, over time, they'll grow and expand. I'm not sure what Nancy's issue may be, but uh, we'll be glad to answer those questions. If you'd like to call in at 706-865-3181 or info at WRWH.com. And we do, um, we're going to continue taking your calls this morning because it's a great day, isn't it? It's just gorgeous outside. It's gorgeous outside. The air is just nice and cool. I haven't been out for the past 50 minutes, but uh, I assume it's still pretty cool. It was yesterday all day long. Feels like a fall day, but here we are, really, the dog days of summer, the end of August, right? And if your dogs are howling because it's so hot, hey, today is a great day to get outside. Today is a great day to get outside, to get growing. And think of those questions that have just been burning in your mind, and let me help you answer them. Let me help you be successful. I'm going to give you our number one more time, 706-865-3181. And you can join us on YouTube. Like we've already mentioned, we're having a good conversation in between breaks with people and giving them tips and suggestions. And so we'd like to do the same if you'd uh, like to give us a call in. Talking about the dog days of summer, water becomes an issue, right? We've had a little rain. We've had some rain, and really, it's been sporadic, right? Um, but it can container plants can quickly dry out um, in the matter of hours. You see, at the nursery, we grow our plants in containers, and we do that sort of thing um, that way. And we have to water every day because these containers, they dry out in the sun, But your containers will probably need to be monitored at least. If they're large containers, they may be able to hold a kind of reservoir down deep inside the container. But if not, then you'll have to kind of supplement with water. Well, how do you know in these dog days of summer if your containers need water? They don't need it every day necessarily. They may or may not, depending on where the container is. So what you need to do is you need to kind of stick your finger down into the soil and feel if it's moist. If it's moist, it's probably okay. But if it's dry down, down, uh, further down into the container, you may want to go ahead and just reapply some moisture for that. So this is the Dog Days of Summer. I'm ready to help you answer these dogging questions at 706-865-3181. But until you call in, let's listen from Ethel and see what is burning in her heart and garden this morning. And now a Southern Garden soliloquy from Ethel, because when she goes shopping for plants, she really can't stop. Hi, my name is Ethel. And I'm a plant addict. I really hate to admit it, but it's true. When I see a new plant and all of its gorgeousness, it really grinds my gardenias. Sure, I just came for a bag of fertilizer, but I'll be leaving with my trunk full of roses, daisies, peonies. Oh boy, it's a long list. I mean, for heaven's sakes, my garden never seems as big as it did when I placed my seed order in the winter. I swear, winter makes my garden just swell with opportunity. But there I am, in springtime, surrounded by a sea of a gazillion little Dixie Cups, full of seedlings that I just can't part with. 
I know that I'm undeniably nuts, but I blame it on stepping on my rake times up too many times. Sure, I should be saving during my retirement years or something important like that, but don't you understand what that beautiful plant is saying to you as you pass by? Take me home. Plant me. You will love me. I will love you. We'll love each other forever. It sure is tough to say no with a cry like that. Well, as the old saying goes, a good gardener knows his limitations but isn't confined by them. (laughs) So, do you think I'll be throwing in the trowel on my plant addiction anytime soon you can bet your crepe myrtles i won't (laughs) all right well you know uh, ethel sometimes she gets on my nerves she's always always being a, a little rude about things but i think she is true at heart you know i think her gardening skills is um are well beyond mine and she is very very um experienced but you know the the reality is is we do sometimes if you are like me and you are just a plant geek or a plant nerd a garden garden geek garden nerd whatever you really do have this problem and i know that i tend to just if I see something cool or different, I go for it. You know, um, kind of the new shiny, the shiny things um, to do. Uh, but uh, if if you have a question this morning, give me a call at 706-865-3181. We'll be glad to answer your gardening questions or send us a message, info at wrwh.com. We do have a question here I want to answer. But before we do, I want to remind you that you can join us live on YouTube. Just search YouTube. Um, sorry, when you go to YouTube, just search WR. WH Radio, and you'll find the channel there. Hit, be sure to hit subscribe to the YouTube channel because you will get notifications whenever we are streaming live, and whichever program throughout the week is streaming, you'll be glad to join us, and you'll know that you can do that. Now, here's an interesting question that we're getting uh, through our, all of our streaming this morning. Uh, the question is: Are cheap plants more likely to die? Hmm. I've never had that question before, but are cheap plants more likely to die? So cheap plants, cheap plants are probably just fine plants. Uh, depends on the type of plants. Um, sometimes plants are cheap because they are on their way out. They are dying. I, I know when you go to the box stores and the home despot, you definitely see that there are uh, cheap plants on these racks and they've been marked down because they are falling to pieces or Really what's happened is they haven't watered them. But you can be sure that uh, the plants at Lanier Nursery and Gardens are watered. And um, anytime they're cheap, it's because they're probably smaller um, in size, which actually means that they'll grow pretty fast. Uh, they'll become more established. Uh, more. Let's see, maybe back up. They'll, they'll establish themselves quicker than if they were a larger plant. So you can definitely try out the cheap plants. And if they're cheap, hey, give them, give them a shot. This time of year, you may find that some plants are on sale. Um, that are annual plants and of course they're going to die whenever it gets cold but we still have a good month and a half or so before that happens maybe a little longer maybe nearly two months and with that in mind you can definitely um, go ahead and plant them cut back those uh, annual plants fertilize them and enjoy them until it gets until it gets cold we're going to try to do a quick run by we've got just a few more minutes but I do want to get as many questions in as I can uh, my garden doesn't get any sun. Will anything grow? Okay. Now, if you're growing in a cave and it gets no sun that way, then nothing will grow in a cave, right? Except maybe some some creepy critters that are cave dwellers. But um, if it's under high shade, some dense shade, your garden is under some dense shade, um, it's you're, you're, you can still grow things, okay? That's one thing that I like to encourage people. But your plant palette, the plants that you get to choose from are going to be much different than if you were growing in an open, sunny area. Another thing that will happen in shady sites is that you may not get as many blooms on your plants because sun does cause shade. Sorry, sun does. <laughs> that was crazy. Sun does cause blooming to increase, okay? So if you have a shady site, you're not going to have as many blooms. But there are certain plants you can you can purchase. Um, ferns, of course, hostas, um, uh, heucheras. There are a number of plants, and there are some great uh, shrubs. Even uh, Japanese maples can handle handle a good bit of shade and still give you a a decent looking garden. So, 
But just because you're growing in the shade, don't feel discouraged. I get a lot of people that come to the nursery. They say, I can't grow anything. I'm in the shade. I say, whoa, whoa, whoa. yes, you can. You can grow a lot of things. You're just going to have to grow a, a different group of plants, a different kind of plants. And many of them are just as beautiful and wonderful and gorgeous as the ones you can grow in the sun. So, uh, thanks for joining us today. This is, um, of course, Let's Get Grown with Nathan Wilson. I want to say one word uh, before we head out. We've just got a couple minutes left. Um, but I always try to inspire and try to get you excited. So uh, know that these cool days are wonderful. Get out there early in the mornings. Next Saturday, put in your earbuds. Listen to Let's Get Growing. And get. let me give you some inspiration while you're out there. I'm hoping that next week is a cool week. I guess we'll wait and see, right? What's the weather going to be like? Just stick around. But next week of course you can join us at nine o'clock here uh, at wrwh that's 93.9 fm or 1350 am and also we stream live on facebook and youtube and you can join us on the tune in app be sure between now and next week uh, to get the tune in app just download it from wherever you get your apps on your smartphone and you'll be able to sign in there and we'll be able to uh, listen live in the garden maybe you can't uh, hear the radio no problem but this has been a wonderful time and enjoyable for me and enjoyable for all of us, I hope. So let's get some flowers out there and we'll see you next week. This is Nathan Wilson. Thanks for joining us for today's Let's Get Growing program with Nathan Wilson. If you have a comment about today's program, you can reach out to Nathan by sending an email to grow at LanierNurseryGardens.com. Join us next Saturday for Let's Get Growing on Local News Radio 93.9 FM and AM 1350.